when we die, our soul departs from our body. And the soul goes on a journey. And that is when the soul descends into the grave to be reunited with our bodies. And when the soul is coming down, it witnesses the janazah, the funeral. And your body is lying there on the ground, wrapped up, getting ready to be buried. And you're descending and you're seeing this and you're hearing it, you're experiencing it. And when the people then take your body and place it in the grave, your soul descends in there, into the grave, to be reunited with your body. And then your loved ones, your friends who were there at your janazah, they will start shoveling dirt, start picking up dirt with their hands and placing it in the grave, throwing it on top of you. And you will feel it fall on top of you. And they will do this until you are completely covered up. And you will be there in the grave, covered up. And you will have consciousness. You will be alive. Not physically, obviously, but your soul will experience this. They'll walk away. They'll leave. And you will hear their footsteps as the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said that you will hear their footsteps as they walk away. And you will be there alone, in the grave, by yourself. Darkness. Silence. What happens at that point? Two angels come to you, Munkar and Nakir, and they ask you three questions. Perhaps the most important questions you will ever be asked, and the three most important questions you will ever answer. And those questions are, what is your deen? Who is your prophet? And who is your Lord? And if you answer these questions correctly, all three of them, your stay in the grave will be one of peace. You'll have peace, you'll have pleasure. Until the day of judgment, when the horn is sounded and you are raised up out of your grave. But if you don't answer these questions correctly, all three of them, your stay in the grave will be full of pain. So we must answer these questions correctly. But here's the problem. A lot of us say to ourselves at this point, I'm good because I'm a Muslim and I know the answers to these questions and I'll answer them correctly. This is a problem because the answers are not given. As many of the scholars say, the answer is not given with your tongue. The answer is not given with your brain. The answer is given with your heart. What is in your heart will come out at that moment. If you lived your life not really striving to be a Muslim, a true Muslim, trying to practice, then Islam really was not in your heart. So we have to make sure that we're striving, again, to the best of our ability. I'm not asking for perfection. I'm not asking for scholars. I'm not asking for you to be of the best character like the Prophet, peace be upon him, but we must strive for it. So that on that day, when these angels come to us and they ask us these questions, what is in our heart will naturally come forward. The answers, the correct answers, will come forth. After the, we pass the test of these three questions, what happened? An order from Allah with five glad tidings. First, the grave will be furnished from Jannah. The second thing will happen, the person will be clothed from the cloth of Jannah. All these are told to us by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they have authentic hadith to support them. And then the person in the grave, a gate of Jannah will be opened for him or her. And its breeze will come to him or her. And he smells its fragrance and he feels the delight. A fourth, the grave will be made spacious as far as the eye can see. The life of the barzakh, the life of the grave is completely different than this life. Allah will make the grave very spacious. And fifth, he will be given the glad tidings of Allah's pleasure and Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Then a man with a beautiful face, beautiful garment and sweet odor comes and the person in the grave said, who are you? You are, you look so good. You have such a beautiful smell. Who are you? Your face is perfectly beautiful. Then the person will reply, I am your good deeds. 
I am that Salat that you prayed. I am that Sadaqat that you gave. I am the Quran that you read and you memorized. I am the fasting. I am the struggle that you went through. I am the two rak'ah that you prayed in the middle of the night. I am, I am all the great amal. A man with a good face that will be our companion till the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَسْأَلَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal swearing by himself. فَوَرَبِّكَ What is he saying? I will ask them 100%. I will question everyone about what they used to do. We will be questioned about everything. Everything. When the Muslim is about to enter the next world and leave this dunya, the Malakul Maut comes and sits at his head. So it's at the place of the head. Then the, the angels of the heavens come down as if their faces are suns, bright. And they have with them the shrouds of Jannah and the perfumes of Jannah. So when the person is about to pass away, Allah sends a delegation of angels just for him. So angels will come. And they will have with them the shrouds of Jannah and the perfumes of Jannah. And they will sit as far as the eye can see. Now this would apply to the elite category. That they get the best delegation. And generally when the hadith mention these types of things, they mention the highest because that's the prize. That's what you want. You want to have that level that as far as the eye can see. Can you imagine you are in a crowd you are the center of attention and you are surrounded by millions because as far as the eye can see that's like imagine you know like as far as the eye can see is literally we're talking about hundreds of thousands and all of them they are bringing peace and comfort with their presence their faces are shining bright you can smell the fragrances of Jannah. You can see all of them. They have the kafan for Jannah. What do you think the impact will be when you see this? What do you think the impact will be? And that's the whole point. We want to get to that level. And so they will come down and they will sit as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death will say, Ayyatuha nasful mutma'inna akhriji ila maghfirati min Allahi wa ridwan. O oh, pure and peaceful soul, now is the time to exit. The angel of death has that power that Allah has given him that he can take the soul. And even though he can take it in any manner, he is taking it in such a gentle manner. He is inviting the soul, come, come out now. Now come, you beautiful soul, you pure soul, come out and I welcome you to Allah's maghfirah and Allah's pleasure. So this shows us that at the very, very last millisecond between life and death, the person, even though the monitor is saying his heart is alive, even though he's surrounded by his family, he enters a different realm. Now, from our paradigm, that might be a millisecond, we don't know. From our world, if we look at the watch, it might be something that we cannot even count. But from the perspective of the person about to die, now things go into a different time zone. Because the one who is about to pass away, time and space are different, right? The barzakh is different. They have a different sense of time and space, as we said last time, and everybody understands this. So, that person, while they're still alive, they're seeing all of these angels. They aren't dead yet. They see the angel of death. They can still see the angel of death and they're still alive in this dunya. And the angel of death is saying, come pure soul, come beautiful soul, come out and meet Allah's maghfirah, meet Allah's pleasure. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَتَخْرُجُ تَسِيلُ كَمَا تَسِيلُ الْقَطْرَةُ مِنَ السَّقَى so his soul will exit and just go out. The silu, sala ya silu means to flow. This is the, you, you say that, that the, the river, 
the also has sailan it's just flowing the same word is used so the prophet sallallahu said his soul will flow out like water flows out from a jug if you pour water out the smoothness and by the way the metaphor is also comfort because when you see water all human beings it's a sign of peace a sign of calmness and the metaphor that a prophet gave is a metaphor of calmness his soul will exit the body like water when it is poured from a jug so that beautiful just symmetric coming out this is how the soul will exit and it will then reach the uh, angel of death and the angels around it and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they will not allow the soul even one second to be unattended they will take it up to the heavens immediately in other words the soul will not be left alone the soul will not feel empty or naked, naked or anything. No, the angels will come and they will shroud the soul. They will put perfume on the soul. So interesting, by the way, the body, we shroud it. But the soul, the angels shroud it. The body, we take care of it. That's our job. That's fard kifaya on us. If the family is there, they do it. If not, then the community will do it. We have to take care of the body that's left behind. But the soul that's going forward, that is the responsibility of the angels. And the angels will wrap it in the delicate cloths of Jannah. And they will put the perfumes of Jannah on it. And every time they were going up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will pass by other angels. And the angels will say, who is this beautiful soul? And the angels will respond, this person is Fulan ibn Fulan. And they'll mention him by the best names that the people of earth remembered him by. Anybody who said, oh, you're an honest person. The angels will say, this is Fulan ibn Fulan, the honest person. Somebody would have said, you're so generous to us. So then uh, the angels will say, so and so, the son of so and so, the generous one. So all of the adjectives that were used on earth in a positive manner, which means what must we do in this dunya, brothers and sisters? Do khair, do good. We want the angels to use those adjectives, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, the Ahsan al Asma, the best descriptions that the people gave of him, the angels will give as they're going upwards. Now, once again, remember, all of us will go through that. We will all be terrified at that stage. I mean, this is human nature. If you do anything that is new, you will be terrified. How about if you're exiting this world? We will be terrified. What is all happening now? Calmness. Calm. You are being comforted. That not only the angels that have taken you, but every angel you go by, every group that you go by, they're smiling, they're radiant, they're encouraging you. And this is the reward of the righteous life lived in this dunya. The one who lived righteously, now they begin to taste the fruits of that righteousness. So they are going up and still, I mean, obviously there's still a matter of, of panic and whatnot. They're going up and up and up. And every time they go, the angels comfort the soul and mention him with good, with good uh, names. And then they reach the highest heavens. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when they get to the highest heavens, فُتِّحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ the, the doors of the heavens are opened up for him. And so again, imagine the VVIP status. He is the entourage. He is the person wherever he goes, the doors open up. He's being ushered in with the entourage. How do you think this person is going to feel now? More and more, the calmness is uh, setting in. And they go higher and higher until they say that they get to the highest heavens, the seventh heaven. So throughout all of these seven heavens and throughout all of these heavens, the angels are going to be comforting until finally they reach the seven heavens. Then it will be said, Uktubu kitabahu fil illiyin. It will be said. Who will say this? In other reports, Allah will say. So Allah will say, write his name in the register of illiyin. And Illiyin is the name of a register for the righteous people. It is mentioned in the Quran. And it means the highest register from Ulu, from the high. Illiyin, it is the high leg legis the le uh, um, registration. That is where the highest book is written for the righteous people. So Allah Azza wa Jal will announce and everyone will hear, write 
the name of my servant in Illiyin. And then Allah will say, Arju, Irju Abdi ila al Ard. Return my servant to this world because I created them from it and I shall return them to it and then I shall bring them back from it one other time. And so his ruh will be returned to his jasad. lose all their wealth or they lose their loved ones or their job and they feel that they've got no future when they lose all connection with life they commit suicide one of the main reasons is because they didn't have they do not have a belief an iman in a life after here and therefore they don't, know, they don't know why they're here and so they can create their own purpose a lot of them create their own purpose and some of the purposes they create is family. I'm here for my family. That's a small purpose of life. But that's not the whole purpose of why you're here on earth. Because if that was the whole purpose, then Allah will keep us living forever here. Why is there death? Why does Allah take members of the family before? What? And it's strange how some people say before their time. What does that mean? He went before his time. It's as though we knew when everyone's going to die. What do you mean before his time? Death has no age. And this life is not paradise. And we're not meant to stay here. We are here for a different reason. We are here to grow our here after. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and he will judge us in the hereafter because he is the just one. He knows where we're going to be, but we don't know where we're going to be. So in order that we don't argue with God on the day of judgment, Allah says, you can go through the life and see it for yourself. And on the day of judgment, your whole life will be reversed. You will see yourself from the moment you died, you will see everything going backwards. You're living and it's all, you're reliving the moments until you are a baby. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves you from that so you can stay alive. So you don't return back until nothingness. You see it all forwards and then backwards everything and so people who deny their hands and their feet and their eyes and their ears and all of that will bear witness that you did it there is no running away on that day but before that day comes there are signs and it's quite unusual that some people they say I didn't have a sign before I died everyone has a sign before they died die everyone Everyone. But these signs are different. They come in various forms. Some people have immediate signs of death before they die, such as illness, such as even spiritual feelings. Others, they don't have any of these signs. It just hits them like that. But the signs I'm talking about is time. Time. As time progresses, as you grow in age, you're actually getting smaller in age. Every minute that we grow, we're actually getting, our life is getting shorter. And therefore, time is one of the signs. Age is another. White hair is another. Wrinkles. And the Prophet ﷺ said, everything has a cure, except for two things. Everything has a cure. لِكُلِّ دَاءٍ دَوَاءٍ Every illness has a cure. If you find it, he'll be cured. Except for two things. الموت والحرام Death and age, old age. You can't reverse it. All those commercials you see on television about Nivea and this cream or that cream. I don't know their names, but you know. All these creams telling you because, you know, your life and they put these women and men up there as though they have this really fresh skin. This, that, that's, that's a lie. It's, they're just deceiving you. There's no cure for old age. The other signs of the world's end, my dear brothers and sisters, 
are literal signs that the Prophet Sallallahu told us. When I say literal, meaning they are real. But their descriptions are really unknown to us in, 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 in detail. But they are actual things that are going to happen ev that, that will be shared by everyone. So there's specific signs for yourself and there are common signs for everyone else. They are the signs of the last hour. I'm not going to go through them in detail today because that's not our topic. But I'm just going to go through it focusing on the world's end. We're talking about the hereafter. This world ending shows us that when Allah says that everything's going to die, it means everything in this world, including the world itself. Allah says in the Quran, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything on it will perish. The only thing that will be left is your Lord. Presence of your Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in several verses that the world and the sky will perish. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, الدنيا فانية The world is going to perish. A man asked him again, when is the last hour? He said, don't ask about that. What have you prepared for it? But the point is, they're asking because the Prophet had told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the world's going to end. Allah says, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ The earth, the world, and the sky will be changed. From the world and the sky you knew once to another world and sky. Meaning Allah is going to destroy it and recreate another, different to it. Destroy it, make another one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He replies to those who deny the end and resurrection by saying, look at the life that you live in now. وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُرْسِلُ الرِّيَاحَ بُشْرًا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَحْمَتِهِ حَتَّى إِذَا, أق... حتى إذا أَقَلَّتْ سَحَابًا ثِقَالًا سُقْنَاهُ لِبَلَدٍ مَيِّتٍ فَأَنْزَلْنَا بِهِ الْمَاءَ فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ مِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ كَذَلِكَ نُخْرِجُ الْمَوْتَى لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ أو تذكرون. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look at the way we created the life as an example of why, how we are going to resurrect you. Look at how we sends winds and clouds as a good sign for you of mercy so you can have water so you can grow your crops and eat when the clouds fill up we take it to a land that is dead land that has no crops nothing it's dry drought and from it we bring back life of fruits كذلك, just like that Allah says كذلك, just like that or similar to that we will raise the dead people. I say to you, Allah says, I say this to you in the hope that you may remember and reflect. So there are many signs or ayat of this. And Allah says, Kalla Behold, you shall be resurrected. The signs are many. There are minor signs and major signs. As for the minor signs, they began when? Who knows when they began? The minor signs of the closeness of the world's end. The death of the Prophet Sallallahu Naam, his death. So that's 1,437 years ago now. To us it seems a long time. But I want to say two things. If you're 10 years old, 30 years old, 40, 50, 60, you know, in your mind, you know it was a long time ago. But how do you feel? You feel like it was only yesterday. Isn't that right? 60 years, 100 years, it feels like just yesterday. In your mind, you know it was a long time ago. But feeling, it's only a little bit. If you lived for a thousand years, wallahi, it's going to feel the same. There's a narration about Nuh alayhi salam. He lived for a thousand and about 150 or up to 1,350 years. Different narrations, but more than a thousand years. And on his deathbed, the people asked him, how, did you, how do you feel living all this long time? And he says, it's like, he said, it's like a person opened a door, took a step to the other side and then closed the door. And he's trying to say that it's, you don't even feel it. It just passes like that. 
So whether you're now or in 30 years time, it's the same thing. You're going to feel the same as now. So Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ يَلْعَبُونَ the day of accountability has come very close to the people while the people are in are in an illusion of their own ghafla they're forgetful of it they're too busy to away from it yalabun they're playing they're playing around allah says do you not consider that when the day comes it may come to you while you are playing while you are just in ghafla, forgetfulness or unaware. So when the world ends, brothers and sisters, it will be a time where the majority of the people of the world are going to be in losthood, forgetfulness, ghafla, meaning unaware, too busy with imaginations and illusions and things, ideas they've made up. People will be busy in their world of music. Why do I say music? Because the music has an extraordinary effect on the mind and the heart. People listen to it to get out of misery and sadness and get out of the reality of life. But it doesn't take them towards good. It doesn't take them towards God. It doesn't take them towards the Quran. It doesn't take them towards going and doing, you know, good deeds. They'll just do what the song tells them to do. If it's love, they'll live love. If it tells them about death, they'll probably commit suicide. If it tells them about Satanism, they'll go and worship Satan. Whatever the song tells them, they start living it. Some people are living in a world of money. So they try to bring up all this money and try to live in it. They're in that ghafla. They want to forget about death. So they're busy with luxury, entertainment and all of that stuff. And others are busy with other things. Addicted to drugs, addicted to desires of their own. The point is, Allah says, the last hour will come when people are in that ghafla. They're, too, they're busy with some type of illusion in this world that makes them unaware of why they're here. That's a temporary. And Allah says in the Quran about these types of people to the Prophet Wasallam, when the Prophet tried to call them and, and teach them and he would tell them, please listen to me, I want to save you. And, and a lot of them wouldn't listen. Allah has said to him the following verses. Let them, let them eat and let them entertain themselves and let them play and let false hope delude them. And let their hopes of whatever their ideas are, let it delude them. Let it take over their minds for a little temporary while. At the end of it, they're soon going to come to know the reality. It's going to face them. It's going to grab them. It's going to face them right in the face. And they can't run away from it. So Allah says, let them eat, let them drink, let them entertain themselves, let them play, let them be in their losthood, whoever they are. Let them... Uh, and what Allah says, الْأَمَلْ And let hope busy them. What's hope? Hope is good in Islam. Allah tells us, have good hope in Allah, have good hope in His mercy. Well, that's not the hope that the Qur'an is talking about. Saying, let hope, meaning, they've made up their ideas. They don't want to learn, they don't want to hear about heaven and hell, they don't want to hear about death, they don't want to hear about God. They don't want to... It's talking about those who follow their desires, and so they begin to fill, or they begin to inter or fill their, their, their life with busyness of other things. Hope for, let's say, I don't know, to be rich in the future. Hope to... Um, uh, be this or be that or receive this or receive that in this world hope to live longer hope to just keep going yani, let me give you an example I'm sitting in this room one time and there in a work area and I hear this person he says oh you know look yeah, talking I'm going we're going to retire you know you're, he's talking about retirement and superannuation and all that stuff subhanallah what is it, probably about 40 years old, saying, you know, can't wait, you know, the retirement, when we're 60 years old, then we retire. And he goes, it's scary. And then, and then, you know, they were talking about it and saying things like, 
Oh, but you know, but you know, life expectancy is 70, 80 years old if you're healthy. So that's you know, another 20 years or 25 years more after retirement. That's a long time, you know, you get to end. And this person is having this hope where he doesn't even know what's going to happen to him tomorrow. Allah says, let hope delude them. Yani, don't practice your deen. Don't come to, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep in with your, with your bad desires because you have this false hope that you're still going to live for longer. Later on you'll repent. Later on you'll become a good person. Later on you'll, you'll busy yourself with all these things. Later on, later on. For now, you're still young. They're still young. This is what it means. Let you know, this hope of, oh, you're going to still live longer later on, later on, later on. Let that busy them. And really, Wallahi, it's just a busyness. The shaitan is just busying these people. How many people, death came to them like that while they still had that hope at the age of 20, the age of 30, the age of 15. And they're still saying, when I'm 70, when I'm 80. And there's this cultural idea in my culture, I don't know about your culture, that Hajj should be done when you're 60 or 50 or 70. What's this? How do you know you're going to live till then? Hajj is compulsory at any time, like any other compulsory act, like your prayers, like your fasting. So the minor signs in this world come to people while they are in ghafla. And these are one of the minor signs that people begin to drift off. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said people will begin to busy themselves with story, um, uh, imaginative stories and imaginative, t imaginative tales and they begin to make up imaginative tales to the point where people will begin to question if there is an existence of a God that's a hadith what does this mean? really look at our state today a lot of people I mean the movie industry is growing huge now people are burning CDs and movies and there are more and more, I mean, don't ask the Muslims, ask non-Muslim experts who talk about the lifestyle of people these days. Look at it. People are more inside of home than outside. Children are more on the television than outside getting physical. Ask your parents how physical they used to be outside and now it's more indoors in front of that TV. LCD screens are getting bigger and bigger, plasma TVs, you can see it. People are focusing on the quality of what they want to see and hear. You go out to the store and you don't know what to buy. You think I'm going to spend $300 on a TV, you end up spending $4,000. Why? Because this TV has a slightly better picture than this TV. Or this TV has got a slightly higher resolution than this TV. What I'm trying to say is that one of the minor signs of the last hour is that this world of entertainment, this illusion that we want to live in, has become a priority in a lot of people's lives. Really? Am I wrong? So inside this, this world of illusion. And the TV has become the world of illusion. And then they want all the nice stereo system around them. The ones, the little tweeters that get and the ones that bring out the other noises that get as if you're living in there. They want to live outside of the realm of this world. They want to get out of this world. It's true. And they want to live outside of this world. They don't want to live in it. It's another form of intoxication, if you like, but on a smaller scale. Now, if you can monitor it and manage it, it's okay, inshallah. I'm not telling you to be a, one of those Muslims who um, don't think I'm weird now, but I'm telling you that use it in a halal way, but try and don't be extravagant. And I just want you to realize that it can really get people addicted to all these things. They're running away from this world. And we are getting into that hope of illusions. And when you watch these people, these people who are watching all these movies and everything, movies are now dictating what people think and believe. I mean, I've heard young people say to me, this is a new form of counseling, which I have to know. I've never counseled this way before, Wallahi. It's only in the past year. Students and young people telling me, what if there is another world? What if there is another reality? What if, what if? They don't know what they're talking about, but these imaginations, especially in movies, have made people think about other things that could possibly, and so they make up their imagination. As long as they know that other people are thinking like them, they think, yeah, there's a possibility. It's nice to think like that. It's nice to think that when we die, we become ghosts and we just roam around the world. It's nice. 
you know, we're just a ghost. And then you walk towards the end of the, the tunnel, there's a light there. And, and, par- and there's heaven on the clouds and all those things. And um, I don't know, Lord of the Rings and, and uh, I don't know, Sixth Sense and uh, I don't know, you name it, all these other imaginations. The world of the zombies. <laughs> <clears throat> reincarnation and so on so these are the minor signs and now even some a lot of people are questioning whether there really is a God subhanallah my brothers and sisters in Islam among the I'm just mentioning the most you know, significant minor signs that we are encountering now and a lot of us are living it and we don't even realize it another minor signs is that just in general the balance there is an imbalance in the whole world, imbalance in societies, imbalance in morals, imbalance in ideologies and methodologies, imbalance in nature, like imbalance in environment. You could see it. Global warming is one of them. But on a more subtle scale, the imbalance of our morals. Look at it. Look at how much shame has lost its value. says you are busy piling up calculating developing your careers your money your occupation your wealth until you visit the graves think about it when was the last time that you went to a funeral was it your mother Was it your father? Was it your grandfather? Was it your uncle? Was it your cousin? Was it your friend? Was it your wife? Was it your husband? The last time that you visited the grave, when you went to a funeral and you saw that person whom you loved that was laughing, crying, live, boasting, wealthy, educated, denying, arrogant, Whatever they were. What was the demeanor of the people when you walked in that funeral home? When that person was stretched out in their last suit? What was the demeanor? Were the people cracking jokes? Were they dancing? Were they clapping and singing songs? No. Silence. Melancholy. Trauma. Why? Because every person that walked in that room, seeing that person stretched out, the first thing they thought about was not the person. The first thing they thought about was that one day, this will be me. And then after you go to the funeral house, if you got the guts, if you're able to do so, you go to the grave. And now this is another scenario. And you say to yourself, is that it? I mean, 50, 60 years, scraping, struggling, scheming, lying, stealing, fornicating, jumping up and down, begging, working, and this is the end of it? I mean, is this what's going to happen to me? Are they going to be dropping me into a, a hole in the ground? A hole in the ground, the same hole that a cat digs after it defecates. Just a little deeper. But for the same reason, the cat digs a hole because the cat has dignity, something that human beings don't seem to have. Instinctively, the cat digs a little hole, covers it up. (laughs) Humans have got to be taught to do that, but it's for the same reason. So you and I, we're going into a hole a little deeper than the one the cat dug. And all the people that's crying, pulling out their hair, screaming, almost acting like they're falling in the thing with you. They want to just jump in there with you. Not really though, you know, it's all a, it's all an act. Because ain't nobody really going to jump in there and stay in there. They don't love you that much. <laughs> and then after all the shoveling, 
You have to all the shoveling get done, and they fill it up, and the, the box, you can't even see the box no more, the coffin. The coffin that costs 5000 I don't know, what they, what they, what did they burn somebody in a $5,000 coffin for? I mean, if I was the funeral director, after they left, I would dig them back up and put them in another box and take that box back. <laughs> and, and honestly, I'm telling you, that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. So after all the money and all the drama, and they dig that hole and put you in there and cover you up, so it really means that after all this time and the people walk away from that grave, it's over. What about that person in the grave? What's happening? Because you know and I know that death is almost like sleeping. Death is like sleeping. Your body is gone. Your body is dead. Your spirit is gone but your consciousness is there. Yes, brothers and sisters, you and I are going to know when the people put us in that box and put us in the grave, we are going to know. Your spirit is gone. You can't shout. You can't call out. You can't say, don't leave me here. But you're going to be hearing and you're going to be seeing because that's a different kind of consciousness. But you can't move. And in that grave, this is when the real trauma is going to begin. Because there's a reason for humans to go inside the grave. If the Creator wanted to, He could have caused us to live and then disappear into the, into the atmosphere. But He didn't. He caused us to go into another womb called the tomb. You started out in the womb of your mother and you wind up in the womb of the earth called the tomb. From the womb to the tomb. This is the whole trip. Two angels will come, Munkar and Nakir, the, the, the interrogators of the Akhirah. They will come and they will sit that soul up. We have questions for you and you must answer these questions. They ask him, Man Rabbuk? And that soul will reply, Rabbi Allah. My Lord was Allah. They'll say, Wa Madinuk? What was your religion? They'll say, My religion was Islam. They will say, Wa Man Nabiyuk? Who is your prophet? And the soul will respond, my prophet was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they will ask him, how did you come to know of these things? And they will respond, I read the book of Allah. I read the Quran. I read the kitab of Allah. I read kalam Allah. And I believed it and I declare it to be true. And then a voice from above the heavens, from above the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond, Sadiq al-Ameen, my slave. My slave has spoken the truth. My slave has spoken the truth. So make sure that his carpets are spread out from Jannah in his grave. Make his gardens beautiful for him. Open the grave expanse for him. So a door that is from Jahannam will be opened. And that person will be able to feel the fire, will be able to feel the fire of hell coming in. And it will be responded to him. The angels will tell him or her that you see this door this is what could have been your eternal abode had you disbelieved and disobeyed Allah. And then that door will be shut, permanently sealed, never to be opened again. And then a door to Jannah will be opened. The perfume of Jannah will come pouring into their grave and it will be said to them, this is your final abode because of your belief. Because of your belief, subhanAllah. And it will be said to him, rejoice in the delights for you because this is the day that you were promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the day that you were promised. Beautiful figure, gorgeous, will come and sit down next to them. Will come and sit down next to them. And they will look at that person and say, who are you? You are so beautiful. So I've never seen something or someone so beautiful in my entire life. Who are you? And that person will respond, I am your good deeds. I am your good deeds. And Allah has sent me to keep you company until the day that you meet him. Because you kept your promises. And that soul will continue to cry out every single day until the day of judgment. That soul will cry out, my Lord, my Lord, establish the hour. Establish the hour right now. I want the day of judgment to come now because I want my promises. I want what was promised to me. I want it now. This is the state of those who believe.
Many faces who within themselves, they think, you know what, brother, I've got a long time to go, man. I'm young, brother, I'm young. My brothers, I've had the most interesting five weeks of my life. I've buried almost eight brothers in the last five weeks. All of which were under the age of 25. All of which were under the age of 25 years old. And they didn't die because I was sick. They didn't die because, you know what, he had some illness that doctors couldn't work out. No, perfectly fine boys. Wallahi, one of them, one of them, 18 years old, built like a tank. We actually had to bend his legs when we put him into the ground. He was so big, we actually couldn't fit him into the hole. We actually had to bend his legs to get him in there. Under the age of 25, and ask me how many of them prayed. None of them. were familiar with Quran none of them this this is what the people around them are telling me this is what their friends are telling me my brothers you sit here hopeful thinking I have a long life what gives you this hope my brother go to the cemetery please I urge you Go to the cemetery and look and read the tombstones. But gone are the days when, you know, Wallahi, I remember growing up, death belonged to Abu Ali and Abu Ahmed, who's done Hajj and all of his kids are now married. And you know, he's got grandkids, he's 70 years old, he's croaking a white beard. Those days are long gone. You know, I'm 30 now. And for the most part of my life, every funeral I went to was in the old section of Rookwood Cemetery. In the last few years, we filled up that one, plus two new sections that they gave us, and we're already halfway through the new one that they gave us. And 70% of these people that are buried there, 70% are under the age of 35 years old. And yet we're still running amok in this world. We're still running amok. My brother's life is serious, man. I hate to break it to you, Wallahi. You know, I can sit here and give you this nice, beautiful talk with the Indian background dancers, Aflam Hindi. I can do that for you, inshallah, and make you feel good. You know, brothers told me, brother, why have you become so pessimistic? Why don't you speak about the mercy of Allah? The Rahmah of Allah gives people hope. Sometimes hope in the wrong hands, hope in the wrong hands can actually destroy the person. One of the great companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I believe it was Ma'ad bin Jabal, I believe it was him. On his deathbed, halas, last days in his life. Conversation now between him and Allah. He says, Ya Allah, you know that I lived my whole life in fear of you. He says, Ya Allah, I lived my whole life in fear of you. And now, Ya Allah, I'm on my deathbed. Khalas, I'm dying. I'm going. I'm leaving. Now, Ya Allah, even if I wanted to do something, I physically can't. Say, so, Ya Allah, I'm asking now. Now I'm knocking on the door of your Rahmah. Ya Allah, now I'm knocking on the door of your mercy. He says, I lived my whole life in what? In fear. But now, Ya Allah, khalas, I've reached an age where even if I wanted to do something, I can't. I'm too old. I'm too fragile. I'm too brittle. I'm too sick. 
I actually can't get out of the bed. Now, Ya Allah, now at this moment of my life, I'm knocking on the door of your mercy. Ya Allah, I'm asking that you have rahmi upon me. I ask you, my brother, sincerely, did this companion not know the verses of rahmah? No, he knew it. But he knew, my brothers, that his life is serious. Brothers, you only get one shot. There's no coming back. There's no coming back. You only get one shot at life. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Wallahi, wallahi. Brothers, brothers, I'm lowering them into the ground and the faces around me are crying and family is breaking down and people are in confusion. Wallah, it was an accident. Wallah, he wasn't supposed to be there. Brother, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. This is rubbish. It's rubbish. My brothers in Islam, there's no such thing as wrong place, wrong time. Do you know what you're saying indirectly? What you're saying is Allah made a mistake when Audhu Billah. No, my brother, he was at the right place at the right time. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to take his life. So I ask you, my brother, how will you be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your life? Why is it that we're 20 and 25 and 26 and 30 and we still feel like we're young? Brother, what made you young? My brothers, you have one shot at life. One shot. There's no coming back. You can't come back to fix things up. Please, my brother, wallahi, I'm begging you, not for my sake, for your sake, make it right, man. Make it right. Now, my friends, his soul will be returned inside his body, inside his grave. Now it will be the grave's turn. And what will the grave say? The grave will say, Kunta la abghaz man yamshi ala dhahri ilayya. Out of all the people that walked on me, you, Abdullah, was the one I hated most of all. You, O oh Abdullah, was the one I hated most of all. O oh Abdullah, I've been waiting for you all this time. I've been waiting for you to come to me. Now that you have come to me today, today I will make you pay the price. Today you will know how I will deal with you. At that time, my young friends, the grave will embrace him with such force, such force that the ribs of one side, they will penetrate into the other side. And Rasulullah practically demonstrated this. He took the fingers of his right hand and he placed them in the fingers of his left hand like this. This is what will happen. This is what will happen. And now, the angels Munkar and Nakir will come. Jibra'il Amin on one occasion asked Rasulullah, okay, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to describe these angels for me. So Nabi Kareem Sallallahu was told, okay, O Muhammad, without telling you the size of these angels, Absaruhuma kal barkil khatif, wa aswatuma kal ra'dil qasif, that their eyes glitter like lightning. Seen a flash of lightning. This is how their eyes glitter. You know their voices rumble like thunder. Their teeth are like the horns of a bull. Their hair reach their feet. The distance between their shoulders is miles apart. You know, if you wanted to cover the distance from one shoulder to other shoulders, it would take you days and days. Rasulullah was told that in these people, there is not even an ounce of mercy inside their hearts. Their mercy is only for the true believers. They will come to everyone. Each one of them will carry a hammer of steel. My young friends, all those within the dunya, from the human kind and jinn kind, if they were to get together just to pick up one of these hammers, never mind moving it an inch, they will not be even be able to move it a millimeter. Not even a millimeter. 
they will come to him in his grave. They will reproach him. فَيَنْطَحِرَانِ إِنْتِحَارًا يَتَقَعْقَوْ مِنْ وَعِظَامُهُ وَتَظُولُ عَذَامِ الْمَفَاسِلِهِ فَيَخِرَّ مَخْشِينَ عَلَيْهِ They will reproach him in such a manner. Allah protect that every bone in his body will begin to crack. Every bone, they will reproach him. He will faint. When he comes round, they will ask the three questions. مَنْ رَبُّكْ مَا دِينُكْ مَنْ حَاذُ رَجُمْ يَا هَذَا اِعْرِفْ مَكَانَكْ Recognize where you are. Look around you. The dunya has come to an end. You are now inside the grave. Tell us, مَنْ رَبُّكْ Who is your Lord? Now you and I were sitting here and we're thinking, Yeah, Yaar, I read the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Who doesn't know the answer to these? Who doesn't know the answer to these? My Lord is Allah, my deen is Islam, and this man is Muhammad. Who doesn't? These are simple. My young friends, you know, in there, if you haven't lived a life according to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know what? Just as those that wine and dine whilst they're alive are whining and dining on deathbed and rather reading the kalima la ilaha illallah, they're uttering nonsense like give me intoxicants to drink. If you spend a life like this, when these angels ask you these simple questions, and indeed they are simple questions, my friends, you will not have the answer. Now this guy was whining and dining. You know when the question is asked, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? What do you think he will say? Allah says in the Quran, Araita man hawa. You know, he was one of those, okay, his God, his Lord was his desire. He didn't listen to Allah, he didn't follow the teachings of Rasulullah. He was following his desires. His desire was saying, you know what, this girl look absolutely, she's dynamite, she's beautiful. Go for her. He was going for her. His nafs was saying, forget Salah, yeah? let's go chill with the boys. Hang out on the street corners. He was doing this. His nafs was saying, you know what, it's not too bad to have a tablet or two. Enjoy yourself. You know, you've only got 10, 15 years, life's to enjoy. That's what he was doing. He was listening to every single thing that his nafs was saying. This was his God, so what is he going to say? La ha ha la adri. I don't know. We'll ask him. Man, uh, they're going to ask him, Ma deen, what's your deen? There was no deen in his life, yeah? You know, he believed that, you know, you turn to Allah when you're 70. You know, when you can't pull anymore, you've got nowhere to go. You know, bones are cracking, you've got arthritis. You know, you, 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 you become weak. Your, you know, wrinkles on your faces. This is what he believed that you go for Hajj at that age. Till then, you know, you enjoy. So what's he gonna say? What's your deen? There was no deen in his life. He was just a chiller. Man hadha rajul. Who was this man? He didn't know who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. He read the kalima la ilaha. But he didn't know who Muhammad was. He never followed Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He used to follow the likes of. You know, Ronaldo's and the Messi's, the Ronaldinho's. He used to follow people like, you know, these the movie stars, these pop stars. You know, the way they were combing their hair, the walking the walk and talking the talk and the clothes and the cars. You name it. For him, they were the role models. What's he going to turn around? What's he going to say? He ain't going to have an answer. Ha ha la adri. And at that time, my friends, فَيَضْرِبَانِهِ ضَرْبَةً يَتَتَايُرُ الشَّرُرُ فِي قَبْرِ They will strike him with that mace. With such force, my young friends, that the sparks will spread throughout the grave. Sparks will spread. And it will be said to him, look above. And a door will be opened to paradise. He will look above. He will so, he, the, a do, the door will be opened to paradise. He will be able to see paradise. He will be able to see the blessings of paradise. And it will be said, Ya Adu Allah, O enemy of Allah, Hada manziluk law ata'at Allah. How do you worship Allah? Then this was your abode. But you didn't. Rasulullah at that time swore by his life. He swore by his life. You know, at that time, he will feel such regret, the likes of which he's never felt before. You know, that that's when reality will come before his eyes. You know, he's seeing Jahannam. And he knows now that he's been deprived. He knows what's going to happen thereafter. At that time, Rasulullah swore by his life. That, that, that individual will feel such regret the likes of which he's never felt before. A door will be over, open towards health and it will be said, Oh Adu Allah, Hada manziluk lima Allah. Oh enemy of Allah, this is your abode because you disobeyed Allah. 
on the hot fire of Jahannam will keep on entering his grave and he will roast right till the day of judgment. Hadith of Bala ibn Azim, after the questions, a caller will call out. And Kazaba Abdi, for Frishulahu min al Nar, Walbisuhu min al Nar, Waftahu lahu babin il al Nar. Give him the clothes of Jahannam, give him the bedding of Jahannam, and open a door towards Jahannam for him. Thereafter, a man will come inside his grave. Qabihu al Waj, Qabihu Sayyab, Muntin al Ri. This man is ugly of face, his clothes are ugly, he stinks. He will come in his grave and this man will begin to mock. He'll begin to take the mick and he will say to him, you know what? Abshir, Abshir bil ladhi yasuak. Good news. Good news. Glad tidings of what? Al ladhi yasuak. Of that which troubles you, of that which gives you taklif, of that which brings you pain. Hadha yawmuka ladhi kunta tu'ad. You didn't believe. You were just too big to believe. Hadha yawmuka ladhi kunta tu'ad. My young friend, this is the day that you were promised. Allah mentioned it in the Quran, what your outcome will be if you reject. Rasulullah mentioned it in hundreds of ahadithes, what your outcome will be if you reject. The a'imma on every Jummah would remind you of the consequences. In gatherings like this, you were reminded of these consequences. But you refused to believe. You didn't believe that you were going to die. You didn't believe there will be accountability. You didn't believe that the angel will come. Today, you will pay the price. And he will ask, and who are you? فَوَجْهُكَ الْوَجْءَ الَّذِي يَجِئُ بِالشَّرْءِ Your face brings bad news. Who are you? He will turn and say to him, أَنَا أَمُلُكَ الْخَبِيسِ You know the bad deeds that you performed in the dunya? I am those deeds. Allah has given me a body so that you can see what you did in the dunya. And my friends, when he can see his deeds before him in the, in, in, in the form of a body, black body which literally stinks, which black clothing, my friends, he will begin to beg the Almighty Allah. He will now know what's going to happen, my friends, and he will begin to beg the Almighty Allah, Wallah, Rabbi la tuqim asa, Rabbi la tuqim asa, Wallah, I beg you, do not bring the final hour. Do not bring the final hour, because he knows that whatever happens thereafter will be a million times more severe, and it will keep on increasing and increasing and increasing, and there is no end. Hadith of Bara ibn Azib, Says for your kayyud lahu asab abkam. Thereafter, a blind and deaf tormentor will be appointed to torment him. Blind and deaf. Why blind and why deaf? So you know when he's crying inside his grave, and he's begging, and he's shouting, and he's screaming, and tears of blood are flowing from his eyes, and he's begging for compassion and mercy to be shown. These tormentors will be blind and deaf. So they cannot see him crying and they cannot hear him begging. And they will have a hammer. When they strike it on a mountain, it will turn to dust. And when they strike him, all the khala'iq, the creations of Allah will be able to hear this. Other than the thakalain, that is the humankind and jinn kind. Sayyidina Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala relates, the Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُسَلَّتُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِ فِي كَبْرِ تِسْأَةٌ وَتِسْأُنَ تَنِينَ تُنْحِشُ وَتُلْدِغُ حَتَّ تَكُمُ السَّاعِ Ninety-nine serpents will be sent upon him and they will keep on biting him till the day of judgment. Such is the venom of one of the my young friends that if it was to sting the earth, nothing would grow on the earth right till the day of judgment. Ninety-nine upon him and they will keep on stinging him, stinging him right till the day of judgment. Right till the day of judgment. The reality of the matter is, my young friends, different people will receive different punishments. If you don't have that faith in Allah, and you don't have that reliance on Allah, and if you don't trust Allah, you will be so sad. You will not be able to live a day. When I die, where am I going? I promise you, I trust Allah and His mercy. And I trust that I'm going to a better place. I have no option, subhanAllah. I tried a little bit here and there. I seek forgiveness from Allah on a daily basis. 
I know I'm not an angel. I've committed sin here, there. We are human beings. But we seek the forgiveness of Allah. We are relatively good people, inshallah. We hope that Allah will give us paradise and we will die with that conviction and we will not let shaitan tamper with us to make us think that you are far from the mercy of Allah. When we have heard Allah is Ghafoor, Rahim, Tawwab, Ghaffar, etc. Wadood, most loving, most kind, most forgiving, most compassionate. I know those qualities of Allah. Why should I doubt Allah? For what? If I go back to Allah, Wallahi, I'm going to a better place than I am right now. I'm not. Meaning, I'm not shaking in my conviction at all. And this is what keeps a believer going. Otherwise, you become so depressed. You struggle with anxiety because you don't know what's going to come and you have no trust in Allah. That does not mean everyone who is struggling with anxiety has weak faith. No, but it does mean that faith would help you overcome anxiety. There's a difference between the two. You don't struggle with mental illness because your Iman is weak, but strong Iman will help you through your mental illness. There's a big difference between the two. We are human. We will go through challenges, but my brothers, my sisters have faith in Allah. You lost a loved one, have faith. You will be reunited with those loved ones by the will of Allah. You will sit again together and smile and laugh and talk about the days of the world if Allah wills. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Allah says, those who believe and their families followed after them in belief and with belief, we will unite them thereafter with that faith in the hereafter. Allah will bring us together. So you did not lose a loved one in totality. There was just a pause in communication between you for a while. When you go, you will be with them once again. And guess what? When you go, the others, you will wait for them to join you as well. Just like you waited for those who passed on from your family before you. They will wait, subhanallah, to join you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. One of the chapters of the Quran, this is a book of 6,626 verses, 114 chapters, that was revealed to a man called Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, who himself claimed to be a prophet of God, like Jesus, like Moses, like Abraham, like David, like Solomon. He claimed to be a prophet. And we believe, as Muslims, that he was a prophet. We believe that this Quran was, in fact, revealed to him. This is what our belief is. You don't have to believe that, but we do. In this book, among other things that I'm going to tell you about this book, there's a verse that says, أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Says, Glory be to the one in whose hands, whose power there is all the dominion of the heavens and earth that we, you and I cannot even imagine. It's established that there is a power, there is a mind, there is an intelligence, there is an authority, there is a sovereignty behind this, what we call the creation. And that power and that sovereignty has all absolute power, not humans, not governments, individuals or collectively, Past, present, future, nothing. We're just sophisticated sperm drops. That's all we are. Sophisticated. But that's where we started out. And in the end, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that's all we'll be. It is that authority, that power. It is that mind, that intelligence that has created the heavens and the earth and everything in it and created death for the humans before giving them life. Think about that. Death was conferred upon us before we were even given life. It was already there, inescapable. When you came into life, 
you carried with you the imprint on your DNA, you got to die. That's a ticket that comes with the package. Life, death. But in this particular verse, we usually as humans say life, death, because we're living looking at death, even though we ignore it. But in this verse, it switches it because the one who has given the life says death. We give you as a gift life. In order to see which one of you will be the best in their behavior and in their conduct or their responses. Now that verse gives us the premise of our discussion. That the purpose of life, this small little like that, that's all it is. We think of it as days, weeks, months, years, we call some of us, what do they call a person who's um, 100 years old, we call them? A centenarian or something, what's that terminology? Somebody who's 80 years old, we give them different names, but it's just like that. And if you're 60 today, or in my case, 59 in three days, maybe I shouldn't have said that, huh? <laughs> See, think back, think back when you were 15 years old, 12 years old, when you were just playing around in the schoolyard at home, uh, doing this and that, you had no problems and you're thinking about life and all the things you want to do and what you want to be and what you're going to achieve and your brothers and your sisters and your mother and your father and your house and no responsibilities, no rent, no bills, no nothing. Think about it. When was it? It was just yesterday for me. It was just yesterday. Just like that. Where has the time went? What has happened? And now today, everyone will agree. It seems like the sun rises and sets and the day is just going like this. You can't even say, so what, what happened? What was today? So today is Tuesday. So Tuesday, brother, this is Thursday. So what, what happened? It's time. Because time is nothing but a capsule. Time is nothing but a drop of water on the windowsill and the sun comes, it's gone. That's time. And that's what you and I have been given. We've been given time. And what you're gonna do with this here time? In the Aqeedah of Imam Tahawi, we recite that we believe in the tablet and the pen and everything that's been settled within there. Now Rasulullah the Messenger tells us that first there was Allah and there was nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his throne. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen. And when the Prophet ﷺ says Khalaq Allah al-Qalam that Allah created the pen, he, he says, Wa kana arshuhu alama that his uh, throne was settled upon water, that there was a layer of water under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the scholars they take from that, that Allah obviously had created water before the pen, but we don't have much details yet because the heavens and the earth had not been created, but it makes sense because water is the source of everything as we see later on um, in the discussion. But it comes now to the to the pen. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Al-Qalam, He created the pen. What are the dimensions of the pen? How does it look? We have absolutely no idea. I mean, in this world, uh, every pen looks so different. You know, you can't imagine what this pen would be. And is it a pen like the pens that we write with? Allah knows best what it looks like and how it is. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen. And the Prophet ﷺ says, فَقَالَ لَهُ أُكْتُبْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the pen, write. قَالَ رَبِّي وَمَاذَا أَكْتُبْ And the pen said, Oh my Lord, and what should I write? قَالَ أُكْتُبْ مَقَادِيرَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى تَقُومَ سَاعَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the pen, Write the details, the decree of everything that will happen and that is, that is decreed until the establishment of the hour, until the hour uh, begins and commences. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَنْ مَاتَ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ هَذَا فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever dies believing in anything other than this, then he is not from me. So the Prophet ﷺ said this took place 
50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already had Al-Qalam, this pen, write down everything. So the Qalam, the pen, which was created 50,000 years before the heavens and the earth, wrote in what's known as Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz, the preserved and protected tablet. Allah calls it Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz uh, because it's protected from any changes and it's also protected from access. No one can access this preserved tablet not from the human beings, nor from the jinn, not even from the angels, not even from the malaika. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has access to Allah al mahfuz And so it's protected, it's preserved. Only Allah knows what's within it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He calls it many things in the Quran. Allah calls it Kitab al Mubin, Imam al Mubin, a clear book. So there are no, there's nothing ambiguous in that book. It documents everything precisely. Allah calls it Kitab al Mastur. Uh, an unrolled, untouched tablet, right? So it's never been touched. It's never been, uh, the papers are not wrinkled in any way. And of course the papers don't look like the papers that we have as well. It's a very special type of book. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ That there is not, that, that there is no knowledge that is missing from that book. Everything is within that book. Even as Allah tells us, even a leaf falling from a tree. Now think about how extraordinary that is. A leaf falling from a tree, at what speed it will fall, what type of leaf it will be, what land it will fall upon, uh, what will happen to it, um, you know, uh, who will pick it up, you know, when will it dissolve. All of that has already happened, that could, that's happening right now. You know, you might run over something as you're driving with your car. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that. Uh, while you're opening a door, um, you might struggle with the knob or you might turn it the wrong way. It's already written in a lawh al mahfuz 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And you know, we could look at that with a sense of optimism uh, as well. And Imam al-Sha'bi rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he was once sweet talking his wife. And he said, isn't it amazing that 50,000 years before Allah introduced the skies to the seas, he already wrote down your name next to me. You know, So it was 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, our names were already written down next to each other. So everything is within Allah al-Mahfuz, everything is within that preserved tablet, everything that would have happened, that has happened, that will happen. And you know, we don't have much about the description of it, uh, except for a, a pretty lengthy narration from Abdullah bin Abbas ta'ala anhu. And Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu, he says that Allah al-Mahfuz is preserved in Al-Bayt al-Ma'mur which we'll, we'll probably talk about later inshallah ta'ala, the, the frequently visited home where the malaika, the angels do tawaf. And it's preserved directly under the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, directly under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the seventh heaven. And he said it's made of, of red rubies. And of course not the red rubies that we see, it's, it's made of a special type of red rubies. Its upper end is tied to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its lower end reaches towards the angels. Its script is light and its pen is light. He said, Allah glances at it many times, hundreds of times a day, and with each glance, He does what He wills. He exalts one who is humble, He humiliates one who is honorable, He enriches one who is poor, He impoverishes one who is rich, He gives life to one person, He gives death to another person, and He does whatever else He wills. La ilaha illahu, there is no God but He. Now that brings about a very important question. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written everything down with Al-Qalam, with the pen, and if it's all contained in a lawh al-mahfuz, in the preserved tablet, and everything that was to happen has already been written down, then how is it that we have any role in altering our destiny? How is it that anything can be erased or confirmed? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about a lawh al-mahfuz, or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about something else? Well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he clarifies that in that very hadith of Ibn Abbas عنه, that we discussed, where the Prophet is telling him to be mindful of Allah, and he tells him that if the entire world was to gather to benefit you with something, they would not be able to benefit you with anything unless Allah has written it for you. And if they were to, to gather together to harm you with something, they could not harm you with something unless Allah has written it for you. At the end of that hadith, the Messenger says, رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامْ وَجَفَّتِ suhuf. The pens have been lifted, and the pages have dried. So what the Prophet ﷺ is indicating to us is that there is more than just Al-Qalam, there is more than one pen, there are multiple pens. And we find this through the Qur'an and the Sunnah, Allah and the Messenger ﷺ describing to us different types of writing. So for example, there is the Night of Decree, Laylatul Qadr, 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes down the decree or causes the decree for the next year to be written down. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned hearing the pens, hearing the ringing of the pens and the unraveling of the pages as the angels were, were writing down on Laylatul Qadr, on the night of decree. And Ibn Abbas عنه, he takes it even further. He says that everything that is to happen the next year is written down that night. Uh, if, you're, if you are going to die that night, uh, if you're going to die that year rather, it's written down. If something, you know, misfortune is going to strike you or something you've been waiting for or anticipating, it's written down that night for the previous year. Then he even says that the names of the people who are doing Hajj the next year are written down on Laylatul Qadr. Also, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us the angel that comes to our mother's womb when, when, when we are still just four months. And he writes down the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees, which are our lifespan. So it's already been written down how long you're going to live, your date of death. SubhanAllah, before your date of birth, before you're actually born, your date of death has already been written. Think about how profound that is, how you can't, you know, you will not be able to alter that, right? Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi mentions, he writes down as well your risk, your sustenance, meaning every single penny that you would earn, every penny that would go into your bank account, every single balance that you would ever have, it was already written before you were brought in. So don't think it's in your hands. Don't think that you need to rush to do haram or do prohibited things because you know, you're going to somehow get more than what's been decreed for you. It's already been written down for you. Lastly, the Prophet ﷺ said, Sa'id aw Shaqi. He's written down as a happy person or a deprived person. And Shaqi is the opposite of Safi, so, which, which means to be full and which, we, which means to be fulfilled. So Shaqi here, the context of it is that he's deprived of goodness. He's deprived of true happiness, uh, which is the happiness of the hereafter. And, and you know, that's something that's, that's very profound as well that we're already written that way once we're brought into this world. So again, how do we alter that? And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi or rather Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions to us, كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْ That every single day Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is writing. Every single day Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is decreeing. Now, where does that leave us? Then what's the point of making dua? What's the point of working? What's the point of doing anything? If it's all been written down, you know, the only thing we've established now with multiple pens and multiple papers is that's more that's being written down against us, right? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said that all of that can be changed by dua. All of that can be changed by supplication. Okay, the only thing that cannot be changed by virtue of supplication is a lawh al mahfuz is the preserved tablet. Because a lawh al mahfuz in its writing already takes into consideration what would have happened had you not made dua and what would happen as a result of you making dua. The records of the angels do not indicate that. So what that means is the records of the angels might say that your date of death is uh, April 1st, 2015. Okay, but then you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you do good deeds because the Prophet sallallahu he said that nothing causes the lifespan of a person to increase like his good deeds. So you do good deeds and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes your date of death to change. Now the angels records would be changed. Allah al-Mahfuz would already have your previously decreed date of death as well as the new date of death that came as a result of you making dua or as a result of you doing good deeds. So Allah al-Mahfuz is perfect. It already has that into consideration. The same way that, you know, by virtue of you eating or drinking, you know, you extend your life for another, for another day or by virtue of you taking this medicine, you overcome that sickness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already takes it into consideration in Allah al-Mahfuz, what would have happened had you not taken the medicine and what does happen as a result of you taking the medicine. And so dua is spiritual medicine. Okay, dua, uh, supplication is our spiritual medicine and nothing is beyond our dua. Nothing is beyond our supplication. at the time of death there was one brother his whole life what did he do he was an alcoholic he would drink day and night with his friends when his time of death came listen to this carefully when the time of his death came his family were all around him 
and they were saying to him, Beta, recite La ilaha illallah. Say the kalima La ilaha illallah. And what is he saying? He is saying, give me a vodka, you have one also. At the time of his death. And with these words, he leaves his world. Another brother, hooked on to music, day and night, 50 cent, Snoop Dogg, in his car, you know, blasting this music, in his home, blasting this music, 24-7, nothing else to do. At the time of his death, my brothers, true incident, sad but true, Muslim, youngster, at the time of his death, family is saying, recite La ilaha illallah. And he is singing songs of 50 Cent and Snoop Dogg. And this is how he leaves this world. My brothers, you will die at your appointed time. But the choice is yours. If you lived a life of good, if you lived a life of obedience to Allah, if you were an obedient Muslim, you performed your salah, you didn't violate the commandments of Allah, then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says that at the time of death, when the angel of death comes to him, Allahu Akbar. An angel of death, you know who the angel of death is? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam asked him once. He asked him, O oh, angel of death, show me the appearance that you undertake at the time of taking the soul of a good person, of an obedient person. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu so the angel of death, he takes this form. And Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, what does he find in front of him? He finds a beautiful, handsome young man in front of him. More beautiful than him he has never seen in his whole life. Dressed all in white. A beautiful fragrance, beautiful musk was emanating from his body. A fragrance that Ibrahim wasalam, had never smelled before. Sayyidina Ibrahim wasalam, said to the angel of death, that if at the time of death there was no other joy, no other blessing for a good soul then your appearance this appearance that you have shown me would suffice would be sufficient then Ibrahim wasalam, requesting the angel, oh angel of death show me the appearance that you undertake at the time of taking a bad soul he says to him oh Ibrahim you will not be able to bear it you will not be able to see it Ibrahim wasalam, insisted Angel of death says to him, turn away, turn your face away. He turns his face away. The angel of death then tells him to look. When Ibrahim wasalam, looked in front of him, what does he find? He finds a pitch black giant standing in front of him with long hair. All dressed in black. Pitch black giant standing in front of him. Rijlahu fil ard wa ra'suhu fil sama. His feet were on the earth and his head was in the sky and an unbearable stench was emanating from his body and fire was blazing out of his ears and from his nostrils the hair on his body were like men and fire was blazing out of the nostrils and out of the ears of these men when Ibrahim wasalam, sees this scene he fainted after some time when he became conscious he said to the angel of death that if at the time of death there is no other punishment for a sinner then seeing you in this state alone would be sufficient for him. This is the angel of death. If you were a good soul in this dunya, if you lived a life of obedience, if you corrected your lives, make a resolution today that inshallah we will repent to Allah we will correct our lives. We will come on to the way of deen, inshallah. If you come on to the way of deen, and if you are a favorite of Allah, if you are a good soul, then at the time of death, my brothers, the angel of death will honor you. And as soon as he comes to this soul, what does he say? He says, O oh, friend of Allah, Allah gives his salam to you. Allahu Allah gives his salam to you. Subhanallah.
Ibrahim والسلام, the great prophet of Allah once asked the angel of death that you have taken the souls of millions of people has there ever been a time while taking the souls of these people have you ever felt remorse for anyone have you ever felt pity on anyone so the angel of death says yes I remember one time that a woman a pregnant woman was traveling by a ship and while she was giving birth at that time Allah ordered me that you have to take her soul so when I went to take her soul I took out her soul she gave birth to this beautiful baby boy and I extracted her soul at that time after she delivered this boy baby boy and I asked Allah that oh Allah what about this boy the ship is now sinking the ship began to sink because of the weather a stormy night the ship is sinking she's given birth to this beautiful baby boy oh Allah I've taken the soul of the mother what do you want me to do with this boy Allah says that take a plank from the wreckage put him on there safely and then I will look after him so the angel of death wondered to himself he says to Ibrahim والسلام, that I kept wondering that how is this baby gonna survive but look at Allah look at the nizam the system of Allah that when he saves someone look how he saves them this baby is on this plank and it's a stormy night he's being washed away and alhamdulillah when he comes to the shore there are people waiting there and people actually rescue this baby boy this baby becomes after a while he becomes a young boy then he becomes a teenager and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endows him with power Allah gives him knowledge Allah even gives him a kingdom he becomes a king and he is known by the name of Shaddad but this kingdom and this power got to his head he became a disobedient of Allah he violated the commandments of Allah to such an extent that he claimed that I am God so one day he said to his people that worship me do sajda in front of me I am God I am Allah so they said to him but Shaddad look you're a king we respect you we honor you we cherish you but that's about it you know God you're going out of line here so he says well what's the difference between me and God they said to him Shaddad look Allah is the being who gives life and death Allah is the one who has created Jannah and Jahannam so Shaddad says so what life and death I'll show you I give life I give death as well so he told his gods that go and bring a group of people you know innocent people people from the community and this group of people are both before Shaddad and then he makes two groups out of them he says to his gods kill the first group so the first group goes uh, the gods go and kill the first group and then he says to the people look I give death then he says to his gods that go and kill the second group so when the gods go to the second group and they are just about to kill them Shaddha says stop Shaddha says to the people look I give life then they say to him look Shaddha Allah has made a Jannah and Jahannam where's your Jannah and Jahannam so this is the time that Shaddha started to build a Jannah on this earth he gathered the best architects in the world at the time the best builders at the time the most expensive bricks the most expensive equipment he could get his hands off this man got it and it took years it took years and these architects these builders actually made something resembling a Jannah they made such a beautiful garden so many fruits in this garden beautiful women trees Allahu Akbar such beautiful trees they made that the flowers when it, the wind would blow from the flowers the smell the fragrance of uh, uh, musk and umber would emanate from these flowers such a beautiful Jannah he made a Jannah on earth now come the day of the opening ceremony Shaddad is the special guest this is Jannah he's eager to see his Jannah and show the people that look I have made a Jannah as well and he was challenging Allah 
So he gets onto his horse. He is going to this Jannah on this opening ceremony. When he got to his Jannah, and when he was just about to come off his horse, he put one step off his horse, and one step he took inside his Jannah. At that time, the angel of death was there waiting for him. One step inside, one step outside. The, he asks him, who are you? He says, I am the angel of death. And I have been ordered by Allah to take out your soul at this time, right now, at this minute. And the angel of death extracts his soul, takes his soul out. And then later Allah informed the angel of death. That, oh angel of death, this is that same very boy who you saved. You took out his mother's soul, but you saved him. This is that same boy whose soul you have taken out today. My brother's death is in Allah's hands. Only Allah knows when you're going to die. The story here that someone called Sheikh Muhammad, a, a, a Sheikh from Saudi Arabia, and he told him, a young man, a young man called Sheikh Muhammad and said, Sheikh, I want to tell you something very serious. He said, what? He said, we have a friend. And this friend is very good in computer, IT, internet, things like that. Okay, so what happened? What, what about your friend? He said he went somehow, this person, he went to the porn website. And it's not easy to go into the website because it's blocked and there is a lot of firewall and, and, and alhamdulillah some of the countries that you, you don't have access to it easily. So this boy who is, who is a very, very uh, good in, in the internet and, and things like that, he managed to get inside the, uh, it went inside the uh, website, the spawn website, and he starts seeing some videos, some pictures, this and that. And then suddenly, this whatever he's watching, it hang, stops from the website. It stops and it says that in order to get whatever you, you want, you have to pay the subscription fee. You have to subscribe. So he subscribed and he paid good amount of money to do the subscription. <laughs> he gave them their email, of course, for any, anything in order to make, a, make a, an account. You need email, you need password, you need, you know, and if, if it's paid, you have to pay through the visa and whatsoever. The subscription was for five years. He did a subscription for five years that every week he will get these kind of videos and pictures every week uh, with a with lot of... Uh, uh, a package so when this boy paid they sent him an email that okay your account is activated you will receive every week from our production from our filth whatever that they are doing you will receive every week a package and that package will have movies clips videos and pictures of the latest you know our production our filth trash now this boy proudly feeling that he did an achievement. He went to the place where the other youngster, young boy sitting, his friends. And he went and he took his mobile. He says, see, see. Now he's proudly telling other people, see what I have, see. And everyone in the place got crazy. Oh, what is this? W where you got this clip from? Where you got this picture from? And he is so proud. Yeah, yeah. I actually managed to or uh, enter to one of the uh, website and did this and that. So of course now those who are himself and these people, uh, of course they are no salah, nothing you know, uh, far away from Allah doing all the sins. So everyone starts saying, okay, okay, give me, give me this website, give me this website, you know, the, the, the quality, the pictures and blah, 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 all this, you know, it's very good. We want to go and get also. So he said, no, 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 you have to pay a lot because I paid and you have to pay. And by the way, the subscription was for five years. He did a subscription for five years that every week he will get these kind of videos and pictures every week uh, with a with lot of uh, uh, package, uh, these, these uh, files. So he said to the friends that, see, you have to pay a lot, but I can do something for you. Give me your email. Give me your email. So everyone started giving them the email. So he collected almost 20, 30, 40 emails and these friends went to another friends and got their emails. So he reached you know, up to 50, 60, 70 emails. And he went 
and he did something and then every week everyone receiving the same email same email from this man every every time he receives an email he sent to up to 70 people and everyone and he when he goes to the places where they sit he feels so proud that he did something you know achievement he did like you know you know i'm the one who's who's you know giving you all this for free and i paid for it you don't have to pay for it you know I, i'm the boss so the one who's now talking to the sheikh he said now the problem actually after six months this boy he had an accident and he died okay we took him to the graveyard we did everything all the rituals we do the burial and everything then the boy the one who's talking to sheikh now he says after a few days i received an email when i checked the email the email is from the one who's dead the one who's dead i received an email from him he opened the email and he found all that filth and videos and pictures he says, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. He closed it. He said, okay, okay. Maybe he sent me before he died. And then, uh, you know, maybe it was a uh, you know, hanging or something. The next week, he received the email from who? From the one who's already dead. He opened the email. He found all these pictures and videos. He says, like, how come, yani, how come he's in the grave and sending me all these porn and stuff? Like, what, what, what exactly happening? Later on, he realized that when he took the 50, 60, 70 emails, he did ruling, you know, you can do the ruling in, in your Outlook or in your email, that once you receive an email from someone, XYZ domain, this email, once you receive it, you can automatically send it to the other people. So he, after taking the 70 emails, he did this rule or this setup the rule that once it comes, automatically it goes to the 70 people or more. Allahu A'lam. So he said, now the problem, the Sheikh says, then, then stop it. Try to stop it. The boy, he said, I did. I called, I tried to contact the company, the main porn company. I, I figured because it's mentioned in the email from where the email is coming from. So I contacted them. And I told them that, see, this man, this person, he is no more anymore. He's, he's no longer anymore. He's dead. Can you please stop the subscription? So they replied back to the, this person that give us the username and password. He says, we don't have any username and password. The, the, the person is dead. The person is dead. We don't have anything. Can you stop it? So they replied back, sorry, we cannot stop it. And the subscription will, f will, will get expired in four and a half years. It will stay for next four and a half years and we will keep sending every week email to this person now the, not the problem with the person the problem is that he is receiving the email and sending it to other 50 60 70 people and these 70 people subhanallah sending it to whomever so subhanallah yani this made me think yani allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna wa 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 but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying we are the one who raise the dead people and we are the one trace everything that they did and what they are doing and everything is written in the in a clear book and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith man sanna fil islami sunnatan sayyi'a that whoever did anything bad in islam and other people are following that bad thing he will get the sin of it. He will get sin of it by itself, no problem. But imagine that he did something, he created something, a way or a, a, a path which is wrong, which is haram. And other people following that thing, he will get of all these 70 people or 100 people or how many people are getting these videos through this person, he will get all this sin. And Allahu A'lam, what will happen to this person in the Qabr? Obviously, we know that the one who did something good he will get the good result in the Qabr. And someone did bad, he will get the consequences of the bad action in the Qabr. Subhanallah. So that made me think that even in your life, don't do something that you will leave behind that will be, you know, consequences on you. That will be, you know, wabal. That will be a, a, a crisis on you. Imagine this man, this boy in Al Qabr. And, and uh, his friend was thinking that, you know, I'm receiving porn from the Qabr. Imagine, yani, the man is dead, the boy is dead, and he is in the Qabr. 
But every week, this guy is keep receiving and the other people are still receiving. So similarly, and we don't want to leave this dunya except we, we leave behind something good. You know, صدقة جارية أو علم ينتفع به ولد صالح يدعو له. That the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, you leave this dunya and leave at least behind something, a continuous charity, whatever you do. Either it's a continuous charity by making something good or, or a, making a da'wah center or making a, a charity place or making a well or a school or whatsoever. Or at least, you know, leave behind knowledge that the people will benefit from this knowledge. And the more people will benefit from this knowledge, you will get the ajr. Or at least, Allahu Akbar, or at least, at least give good upbringing tarbiyah to your children. So whenever they remember you, they make dua for you. Whenever they make salah and sajda, they will remember you and they will say, Allahumma akhfir li abi, akhfir li ummi. Oh Allah, have mercy on my father. Oh Allah, have mercy on my mother. At least. But imagine leaving something behind which is, have no any value, which has no any benefit. And it will be with you in the day of judgment. It will be with you in the qabr. And it will be with you on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who always try to seek the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. And this is, this is something that Wallahi actually made me to think that you know I should do something good in my life. Uh, life is short, Allahu alam what will happen. And, and we should do something and we should not leave anything behind that, that you know either people are getting sin because of you know, my action or people are cursing me because of my action. Both ways, because the Prophet ﷺ, beside the action, the Prophet ﷺ says if, if there is a mayyit, if there is a death, a deceased person, and the people of this earth, yashhaduna lahu, they will witness that he was a good man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on him. But if people witness on a person that he was a bad man, bad character, arguing, angry, this and that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with him accordingly. Antum shuhada Allahi fil ard. You are the witness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. So we don't want to leave this dunya unless we do something good. The beneficial hadith uh, that the Prophet says, Kullu ummatin mu'afa illa al-mujahirun. All my, all my uh, people of this ummah will be forgiven except those who are doing it openly. So sins. So the companion said that how come, how come they will do it openly? So they said that they will do something in the night and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the barrier, put the hijab on, on their action. But the problem is the second day they will come and sit with their friends and families and whosoever. And then they boost about it. You know, they will say, you know, last night what I did, I did this and I did this and I drank this place and I went this place. and I. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is keep covering you with his rahmah. And you are keep exposing yourself and you are actually exposing and ripping that, that hijab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting on you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will not forgive this kind of person. So the Zakallah khair brother, and he said, you know, this could be the equivalent with, with this boy, the one, the young man, the one who, who openly was proud that, you know, I did this and that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have, have rahmah on him, but yani at the end, uh, the hadith says that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will not forgive this kind of people and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy on all of us.